We are recording. Um, may all that I say and all the chizit that we gain bring nachad ruach to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, serve as a schut for Klal Yisrael, Bili, Lui, Nishmat, Shlomo ben Michael, my dear stepfather, Alava Shalom, to elevate his soul amongst all the other souls who have departed from the world. Amen. Also for the Rafua Shlema of Noah Bat Chaya, Yitzchak Meir ben Rachel. Amen. 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 And Chief Rabbi Beit Shemesh Amen. Amongst all the Chalim of Am Yisrael, there should be no more suffering to anybody. Amen. Okay, to Bishvat. We're going to talk. Um, um, in the beginning, I want to just sort of go through um, the, the, the meaning behind to Bishvat. You know, they say that to Bishvat, and when the person's Chiloni, the two Chagim that's not really celebrated too much, to Bishvat and, Shvat and uh, Shavuot. Um, Tu Bishvat has a lot of meaning to it, and there's a lot of shefa, a lot of abundance that comes down on Tu Bishvat, and I just would like to be able to bring the information so that we can all really tap into this uh, very, very holy day. Um, Sefer HaKadosh Tanya, it's written that um, the world exists because Hashem wills it to be in existence. How does Hashem will for it to be in existence? Through the utterances that he said in the days of the creation, um, the world came into being, and at every milli millisecond of the world uh, of, that we know it, Hashem wills for the, the world to continue to exist. So what we have to understand is that everything would turn into nothingness if it wasn't for a Kaddish Baruch Hu's will. And that's very vital for us to recognize because Tu Bishvat teaches us to appreciate creation. It's the Chag where we get to look at nature and look at nature and see Hashem. See the realm of div the divine through the realm of nature. So to, to appreciate the nature, we have to appreciate first the creation and how it continues to exist. Um, the idea is, Rabbi Nachman teaches us, um, may his name be blessed, uh, may, uh, blessed memory, he teaches us that, and we learned this in one of the past shurim of, in, of anger, when we were speaking about anger, that every person is, is born with a surge of emotion with a, a, a passionate, fiery energy within them. And what happens is, this energy is meant for us to direct it and channel it to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's meant to stir within us a longing and a yearning to want to attach ourselves to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But what do many of us do, unfortunately? We take it, we channel it towards physical lusts, right, honor, um, towards seeking to meet our pleasure, uh, the physical needs as opposed to our spiritual needs. And we end up feeling very hungry because you can't feed the spirit bodily food. It just doesn't work. It doesn't address the subject. It doesn't address the lacking. Um, and so what we learn from this is, is that this need that we have within us, it's there. It's in our heart. It's a matter of us recognizing that if we have this energy, we should be using it towards spiritual pursuits and not towards physical and materialistic pursuits. Um, the Katzka Rebbe teaches us, um, that a person who doesn't look at nature and see Hashem's hand in nature, he's liable for his soul, meaning, He's almost on that madrega, on that level of being a, um, a heretic. And the reason is, because the whole purpose of our existence is to see Hashem in everything, to reveal His hand in everything, and even more so in nature. Because nature, teva in the Hebrew word, is, which is nature, 
is actually the numerical value of Elohim, of Hashem. And in the word Teva is hinted the word is hinted the concept of what we're really dealing with when we view Teva, when we view nature. And that is that Teva is Tavua. It drowns us. It causes a drowning. In other words, when we look at Teva, we feel that we're drowned in the whole world of materialistic physical realm. We don't we don't see Hashem. It numbs our senses. When we look at the, at, at, at the, the world in, it, in itself, we don't find, it's, it's very hard to find Hashem in it. Because we, we feel like, but it's just so evident, so tangible, and Hashem yet is so not there in terms of our physical ability to see His, his supreme being that it's very hard for us to relate to Kaddish Baruch when it comes to something physical. And so, by, but knowledge is power, as I always say. So by, by us understanding that this is really what's happening under the surface, then God willing will be able to control our thoughts and we'll be able to, to look at a tree uh, as in Tu Bishvat, which we'll soon be discuss, discussing, and be able to see Yad Hashem and not say, oh, what a great tree. Um, you, know, you know, this particular mushav produces wonderful apples or this particular... It's not the mushav, it's the blessing that comes down from Hashem and so on and so forth, which we're going to um, talk about. And this is one of the reasons why, actually, on Shavuot, the Chag of Shavuot, um, there's a minhag to put trees around the Arona Kodesh. It's because when we take out the Sefer Torah, when we're there proclaiming the belief, right, the tenant a belief of Judaism, Hashem, you gave us the Torah, Hashem, you're the one that gave us our, our lives. You're the one that chose us to be your children, your beloved nation, your beloved children. We look at the trees and the flowers next to the Arona Kodesh and we tie the two together. We can merge and weave the two concepts together of nature together with Matan Torah. Because if we look at nature and we don't see Hashem in it, we're actually missing the whole point of what Emuna and what living in this world is all about. And again, that's to reveal HaKadosh Baruch Hu, particularly in nature. So we're going to go to the famous saying, Ki Adam Hu Etz Hasadeh. Right? Man is as a tree of the field. So how does a tree get its nourishment? The tree gets its nourishment through the sap. What is the sap? The sap is a fluid that's oozed out into the tree through a hole in the tree. It um, is composed of um, minerals and sugars. It's the nourishment of the tree. Man, what is the sap of man? The sap of man is our inner, the inner essence is our amuna. It's our longing. It's our fiery desire to want to connect to Hashem. That's what keeps us alive. That's what, that's our nourishment. That's what our inner essence, our neshamas need. We need to constantly, the neshama constantly needs to feel its attachment to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Um, And like we said again before, we can't feed our neshama bodily food because it's not going to address what it really needs there's going to still the soul is still going to be feeling that it's lacking so the Maharal from Prague um, in the 1500s uh, Zechah also wrote for man is a tree of the field and his branches are in heaven for the head which is the root of man faces upward and this is why man is called a tree of the field planted in heaven and through his intellect he is planted in his place which if all of the winds were to come and blow they would not move him from his place so what do we learn from this is that a man's head his root the root of his being his head is actually in Shemaim the trunk comes down into this world the branches and the, and the, and the leaves and the fruits of all of the, the tree is his mice, it's his, those are his acts. The fruits of the tree, which is us, man, where uh, the tree, the fruits of us are our deeds. And how do our deeds come about? Our deeds come about through our intellect. How do we get intellect? Through learning Torah. 
When we learn Torah, we increase our wisdom. Through that wisdom, we apply it to Lemaise, right? We actually apply it to our, every, uh, to our everyday lives. The idea of Torah is not just to learn. It's to learn and then roll up our sleeves when we co- go out into the world and to apply what we learn. Otherwise, it's just knowledge. The knowledge just stays. The idea is to spread the knowledge and apply it. Lilmod velilamed, right? To, to learn velilamed, to give back, right? So um, the idea is that man has great potential. We have great potential, just like as a tree has great potential to grow. We have great potential. The question is what we do with that potential. What are we doing with it? Are we using those roots? Because uh, our, our, our essence, th- who we are, the grounding, the baseline of who we are is in Shemaim. And actually, um, I also read recently that the Baal Shem Tov teaches that our neshama, only part of it is inside of us. The, the root of our neshama is still uh, on top. It's still in Shemaim. So oh, we only hold within us part of our neshama. And that's why it says that what we do in this world affects the upper realm. You want to say something? I'm confused about this. Okay. Okay. So we'll we'll apply it. Okay. Later. Um, so the idea is is that lemaisa, what we do here in this world, it affects the upper world and it affects the lower world. So now I want to just pinpoint a little bit more. I found something very beautiful. Um, Rabbi Laser Brody, may live and be well, lists ten important lessons that we learn the, to compare man to trees, and he starts with number one. <coughs> Number one, the the trees give off positive influence on their environment. They give shade, fruit, wood, shelter to the birds and to the animals. They're givers. And by them being givers, they're holy. So how do we learn this and apply this to man? It means that we also are givers. And we also, also are holy. And we also have the ability to affect the environment in a positive way. So um, this is lesson number one. Lesson number two, trees take the barest minimum, minerals and moisture from the soil, sunlight, oxygen. Uh, they, they take the, sorry, they take uh, the barest minimum. What are they? They take minerals, they take moisture from the soul, uh, soil, sunlight, oxygen from the atmosphere, atmosphere. What does that teach us? That we also need to lead our lives in a very humble fashion take as less as possible, give as much as possible. As they say, expect very little and don't be disappointed. Be humble with your expectations. Don't expect the entitlement gratitude, the entitlement attitude that I'm supposed to get and I'm do it and I keep Torah and mitzvahs. Why isn't Hashem giving me back? But isn't it written that if a woman does X, Y, and Z, she's supposed to get, uh, you know, A, B, C, and I only got A, and where's the B, and where's the C, and why am I not getting? We're, we're undeserving of, of everything. We, when we came out of the womb of our mother, we didn't do one mitzvah when we came out of that womb. We don't deserve life. It's not like you could say at that point, oh, well, you know, uh, I did so many mitzvahs, I've done so much in my life. But wait a minute, go back to where you just first came out into this world. When you came out to this world, there wasn't anything that you did. You just came out. And already you were given the first gift, the most important gift, the gift of life. So this whole idea is that I'm deserving of more and I should be having more, that in itself is such a cause of dissatisfaction and, and inner, inner anxiety. It's something that we really need to all work on, every single one of us, that we're really, as they say, I'm not deserving of anything. Everything, Hashem, that you give me, everything from the water to the cupcakes to everything I have, everything is a gift. So that's the second, uh, the third lesson, the second lesson. Third lesson, trees are charitable and benefit, <coughs> and benefit from worthy creatures such as bees, yet suffers from unworthy creatures such as parasites. So we, because we're givers and we're as trees that are very charitable and we give, but we also have to understand that every so often there's going to be unworthy tree, uh, creatures like parasites that are going to leech on to us and annoy us and bother us. But we have to continue, in spite of that, to give of ourselves and continue to benefit the environment. Number four, the deeper its roots, the more vitality it has. 
we said before, the deeper its roots. What are our roots? Our roots are our inner essence, which is our amuna. The stronger and well-founded um, and deeply ingrained our roots are, the stronger we will be, the more vitality we're going to have, the more zest of life, the more energy we're going to have. That's our sap. Remember, that is our sap. We are the trees, just like the trees need the sap to continue to grow and be nourished and healthy. We need Amuna. That is our sap. That's what keeps us going. Number five, the wider the roots are spread out, the more vitality. What does it mean, the wider the roots? The more I learn. The more I'm able to, to diversify myself. I learn a little bit of Torah. I do a little bit of tzedakah work. Right? I do mitzvahs and chesed in my house. I'm diversifying myself. And so I'm spreading myself out so I'm able to touch different areas in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Jewish world. Number six, the solution for a diseased tree is to severely prune its limbs so it can renew itself by sprouting healthy limbs. What is pruning the diseased limbs? It's uprooting those bad midot, the bad midot that we know, the negative midot inside of us that we know needs severe pruning, right? Anger, gaiva, right? Um, a sense of entitlement, uh, which of course is tied to a lack of gratitude. All of those midot need to be uprooted and we need to, Bezrat Hashem, work on it. Um, and Bezrat Hashem, be matzliach on Tu Bishvat. We'll talk soon that it's a day to certainly daven on all these things. Number seven, a tree without water fails to give fruits at first and may be exposed to diseases and ultimately dies. So Torah, Torah is likened to water. So without it, what's going to happen? Without Torah, we're, God forbid, going to also suffer emotional illnesses and stress and anxiety. In essence, we're going to spiritually be dead without the Torah. So how vital it is um, to be connected constantly to Torah. Number eight, if a tree bears fruit the first three years, it loses, it loses longe uh, longevity and yield potential. So man shouldn't waste his energy on transgressing and producing forbidden fruit during his younger years. You know, a lot of people come back to tshuva, uh, you know, when they're younger, they're like, oh, let me go, let me have fun, let me do, you know, enjoy life, I'm young, and, and why should I feel limited, God forbid, restricted, and then later on in life, they come back to tshuva. Um, Sorry, I missed what you said about the tree. How does the tree go? Oh, so the tree, um, the, during the first three years, we are not allowed to pick its fruits. Um, <laughs> so the idea is not to spread ourselves with hospital transgressions when we're young, and when we have energy and, and God forbid producing, um, pr you know, uh, pr producing forbidden fruit in, during our younger years, the idea is to understand that um, it's vital for us to, um, uh, to think ahead and not, uh, God forbid, put, a, put ourselves in a position where we'll be uh, having to deal with consequences of our behavior. Number nine, every tree bears its own particular fruit. <coughs> Okay, so each person has its something, its beauty that it excels in. So it's very important for us to understand every one of us has a tafkid, has a mission in life. And what I could do, someone else can't do. And what someone else can do, this one can't do. Now sometimes we get lost in the world and we feel, well, what's the purpose? What's the meaning? What does it matter? I'm here, I'm not here. I don't do it, someone else does it. We have to understand what each one of us can do, the biggest gadol ador can't do. Everybody has a piece of the puzzle, and it's their unique piece of that puzzle of, of life that, that can be achieved only through their hands. So for us to think that we could, you know, um, not be here, and it doesn't matter, we're just taking up space, God forbid, is, is totally, uh, it's, it's totally untrue. We each have a mission, and every single one of us has to fulfill that mission for tikkun olam, for the rectification of the entire world and creation to be fulfilled. Number 10, even if trees are chopped down but their roots remain intact, they do not despair and they sprout anew. It, which means that even if, God forbid, as we saw 
Shem Yerachem, during the Holocaust, how we lost so many of our Yiddish and Neshamas, but with the roots of the Jewish nation are still intact. If we're still loyal to Hashem's will and to Torah mitzvot, then the roots will sprout a new tree <coughs> and we will continue to exist. And that's, that's especially vital, especially during this very dark and dreary kind of time of, in our generation where we are right now, um, where everything looks um, you know, very difficult and it is very difficult. It's very important to maintain that hope um, that Baruch Hashem, Hashem is never going to leave us and never going to ab- abandon us. Mm-hmm. What was number nine? Number nine is uh, that every tree bears its own particular fruit, how everybody has their own mission. Um, the other thing we learn about the trees is that trees um, that are grown in a field together, when they're together as one, they protect each other. They look after one another. They help weed uh, off the diseases from one another. They help um, share shade to one another. They also know, I, I, I read this somewhere, I don't remember where it was, that trees actually move their branches to um, consider the next tree next to them to give them more sunlight if they need it. It's, they're very considerate of, of one another. Um, the older trees sort of hang over the younger trees to sort of protect it. So what do we learn from this? How important it is to live in a community. How, how vital it is to care for one another the strong caring or caring for the weak in the community, which Baruch Hashem, Am Yisrael Chai, such a chesed community we are. Um, I heard recently something very, very beautiful. Um, there's a, there was a woman who was sitting in, in, the, in a hospital um, in uh, Sloan Kettering, and she was with her son, and the room next to her, there was sitting a, a young mother, a Jewish mother with her child, and um, she said, I think someone passed by and she overheard um, this, this um, Arabic woman saying to her son, look at these Jews. I, they don't even appreciate what they have. Here she was sitting in a room with nobody there, nobody coming to her. And the room next to her had Ezra Mitzion coming and Bikor Cholim coming and, and, and you know all these people crowding the room with food and gifts and high lifeline, like who doesn't come to help a person in need? I'm Israel Chai. You know, we need, to, we need to appreciate how important, how beautiful it is. These are all shlichim lamakom. These are all em- Hashem's emissaries. It's, it's just a beautiful thing to see. We need to appreciate it. So as how important it is for us to benefit, how much benefit we have as a community. You know, you think of the infinite wisdom, how a Kaddish Baruch Hu has, so that there's a, there's a shul, and we're all sort of forced to live around the shul, because on Shabbos we can't drive, so you want to live in close vicinity. And so it's almost by force, right, that we, we all have to sort of live always, the Jews have to always live in certain, like, communities, because we're always around the shul. So, you know, you, you sit down and you think about it, like, a Kaddish Baruch Hu is, like, forcing us that we have to live together. How important it is to live together. Um, trees' roots. The roots are, as we said before, they're necessary to nourish the tree. Our roots are our muna. How important it is for us to have a muna. And recognize the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that's giving us life. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one who's providing us with all of our nourishment, with everything that we need to live. If it's physical sustenance, if it's physical health, if it's children, if it's the house we live in, if everything that we have, everything is being nourished and being taken care of by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And without that amuna, without being able to see Hashem in the picture of life, we're not really being nourished. We're, we're feeling like everything is us. So we're not accounting any of these gifts to anybody else but to us. Our failures are us. Our achievements are us. Everything is us. And then we don't leave any, any other room for anybody else. So we have to always remember to put Hashem in the picture. That is the root. That's what keeps us grounded. That's what keep, will keep us um, steady and not moving when, God forbid, a, a, a difficulty, God forbid, a hardship comes our way. The tree will be well grounded. It won't be moving. It won't be swayed. Those that the roots are our muna. That's what keeps us steady. 
The trunk, the branches, the leaves, that's the external beauty of a tree. The, you don't see the roots. The roots are, un, are underground. What you really see, the external beauty of a tree, is the trunk, the branches, and the leaves. The trunk in, uh, of the Jewish nation is Abraham Avinu. Abraham Avinu was the first one to actually bring out all that was brewing and growing underground, all the potential of the mm. Jewish nation was all hidden. But it, was all, it all came about through Avram Avinu. So the trunk brought it up to life. The trunk was the first time we actually saw it exposed to the outside world, the, the essence of the Jewish nation. And the fruits, the branches are us, the Jewish nation, and the fruits are, are our deeds. Our deeds that we do, those are the fruits. And where do the, who, who benefits from the fruits? Others. The tree doesn't benefit from the, from the fruits. The fruits are sitting there, but other people get to pick the fruits and enjoy the fruits. And again, this is showing also us as a nation how important it is for us to benefit others, to help others, to do for others. And by doing that, we're planting another generation and another generation, and we're continuing the growth of Klal Yisrael. Another pasuk that we also see um, that teaches us about Tu Bishvat. Etz chayim hi in the machzikimba v'tomchea meushal. The Torah is a tree of life to them that hold it fast, and all of its supporters are happy. How vital it is for us to hold on to this tree called the tree of life, the tree of Torah. Again, it's reinforcing the idea that Torah, without Torah, we we just we're not alive. We're spiritually not alive, and spirituality, our neshama, is really what's keeping us alive. How important it is to hold on to that tree, to hold on to that Torah. And, and, and that, it says, that is happiness. That is the true essence of happiness. That's a happiness that is not defined by finite limitations of the world. It's happiness that's beyond the realm of this physical world. The other thing we also learn that's connected to Tu Bishvat is Tu Bishvat, um, the, the Shabbat um, before Tu Bishvat happens to be this year. It's the day, the Shabbat of Tu Bishvat, um, next Shabbat. Um, we say it's Shabbat Shira, where we sing the song Az Yashir. Now, we learn something very beautiful from Az Yashir. Az Yashir, Klal Yisrael stood in front of Yam Suf. Now, the Yam Suf had not opened yet. They were standing in front of Yam Suf, and Az Yashir is written in future tense. Az Yashir! And they're standing there in front of the, the Yam, this big body of water, and they're starting to sing. But wait a minute, what are you singing about? Your Yeshua hasn't come yet. You don't know what's going to happen. The Mitzrim aren't back to you. The water's in front of you. There's no Yeshua. What are you singing about? Az Yashir! What do we learn from this? We learn from this that it's a very high level, of, a, big, a very high madrega of emuna. But what we learn from this is when you're standing in front of a difficulty, when you're in a place where you're in dire straits, where am I going to turn? No, no, na by no natural cause, by no natural means, am I going to make it through this this difficulty? I'm standing in front of that body of water, and I'm going to drown but I'm going to sing, and I'm going to hope, and I'm going to await the Yeshua, because Hashem is going to surely send it. And when they sang Az Yashir, the, the waters opened. So the high madrega of Emunah that we learned from Az Yashir is that by standing in front of the difficulty and hoping for the future that has not yet come, it ha there's no sign, there's no sign of it. On Alpia Teva, according to natural means, I'm doomed. I'm drowned. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I'm done meat. That's it. I'm going to stay in hope. And I'm going to hope. And it says, I wrote this in one of my past um, daily doses. Umikve le Yisrael. It don't read umikve. It says umikave. From the hope mm -hmm. to Hashem, through that will come the Yeshua to hope in Hashem. How important it is to never 
lose hope. Rabbi Nachman teaches us, En Yehush Ba'olam Klal. How important is Everyone knows that Pasuk already today. Because we all understand there's no sense in being in disparity. It doesn't. It's, it's wasteless energy. When you're, I know it sounds very unnatural, almost irresponsible. But when you're going through a difficult time, turn on that music, sing and dance. Sing and envision. Close your eyes and see the Yeshua right there in front of you. There's great power to the power of our imagination. And there's even more power to positive thinking. And, and seeing the Yeshua there. If it's the, 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 the young lady waiting for her Hassan, envision. See it. See it happening. See yourself under the chuppah. If it's someone who's, who's going through difficulties with money, see the check in the mail. See it coming. See your, see your bills being wiped away. Whatever it is, envision the Yeshua. It will come. Tu Bishvat. So what is really Tu Bishvat? Let's talk about the essence of the day now itself. <clears throat> tu Bishvat is a day of happiness. It's a day of renewal. It's a day of Rosh Hashanah. It's Rosh Hashanah. It's a day of judgment. But with the judgment comes a sense of renewal. It's a new beginning. It's a renewal not only of Admat Kodesh, right, of the land of, of Eretz Yisrael. It's because we're at the Sadeh. We're the tree in the field. It's a renewal for ourselves. So, it's a, so what we should go walk into that day of Tu Bishvat with a sense of renewal, of happiness, of planting new seeds of emuna, of taking upon ourselves another something small in the olam of Yiddishkeit. From there we'll be able to grow and, and, and grow stronger and closer to our Kaddish Baruch Hu. We pray on Tu Bishvat to be healed by food and not through medicine, conventional medicine. We ask Hashem that our refuah should come through the foods. And something that Rabbi Nachman teaches as well is if a person was living on such a high madrega of emuna, he would not need to go to doctors for any refuah. He would be able to be totally healed through the foods and the herbs of the ground. At all the refuahs in the herbs, all the refuah is planted in the ground. Hashem has it. The cure for every illness in this world is already available, including my MS. Everything is already there. We just have to live with the Muna and understanding that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has it, has hidden it from us in order for us to reach out for Him so that we can plant a Muna in ourselves through the lacking. What I always say is through that void that we have in our lives, that void, that lacking that we're experiencing in our life, fill it up with Hashem. And then it will no longer be void. Ingrained in all the foods that we see all, always throughout the year, we have to understand there are sparks of godliness inside all of the, all the food. How do we elevate these sparks of godliness? It's through the brachot. So the food nurtures us physically through eating it, right? We get physical sustenance through the foods that we eat. How do we get nourished spiritually? It's through the brachot that we, get, that we say and recite the kavana, with the intent of tying the food to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When we tie the food to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and we say the bracha with, with that intention in mind, thank you Hashem, right? Then we're, we actually are nourishing our neshama and we're elevating the sparks back up to its source. On the day of Tu Bishvat, we ask for Parnasa because that's the day where again we're tying our sustenance, our vitality to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And by tying ourselves to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, through the foods that we eat, we're recognizing Him as the source to providing all of our needs. That's the day we daven for Parnasa. We also ask on Tu Bishvat for kosher etrog. Because on Tu Bishvat, the etrog is in the initial stages of growth. I read something very beautiful that Rebbe and Heller uh, may she live and be well, said over something very beautiful. We all know that the etrog stands for the heart, right? All the Arba Minim, each one represents something. The etrog stands for the heart, represents the heart. So by asking for an etrog, what we're actually asking for is to have a straight heart, a passionate heart, a fiery heart. Brings us back to the same concept of the sap 
and, and, and that longing, that yearning, that craving to connect to Hashem by asking for an etrog, we're actually asking Hashem, connect our hearts. We've spoken about this numerous times, the fortress that surrounds our heart. Every single one of us, we've insulated ourselves so much because we can't stand the pain anymore. We, if it's not in our own home, it's from our neighbor's home. Not in our neighbor's home, in our family's home. If not, it's someone across country, across county, across, uh, across Atlantic, uh, you know, transatlantic. It's, everyone's having some tourists. And we've isolated ourselves so much that we, 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 can't stand, we can't bear the pain anymore. So we create a fortress, on a fortress, on a fortress, and I don't want to hear it. But the problem with doing that, yes, on one hand, I insulate myself and I don't feel any more pain, but on the other hand, I don't feel anything. I don't feel nothing anymore. You can't just open your heart a little bit. I'll just let it, whatever I want, I'll let it seep in and the rest I'll shut out. No, everything's shut out. You're not able to even be joyful at the simcha of your friend. You're not even able to feel a connection, that fiery, burning, uh, intense passion that you want to have with Hashem. Intellectually, we all want to feel connected to Hashem. I don't feel it. I don't feel. Why don't I feel connected to Hashem during Shabbat? Why am I looking at the clock waiting for Shabbat to come out? It's because I've, isol- I've insulated my heart. I've closed my heart so tightly that I can't, I'm not feeling anything anymore. So what we're asking for, HaKadosh Baruch is Hashem help us create this proper balance in our heart so that I'll feel you and, and I, I do, I want to feel pain when somebody else is in, in pain but I don't want it to debilitate me so we're asking for the proper proportion also the etrog which represents the heart the heart of the world is Yerushalayim we're also asking Hashem Yerushalayim Abruya please, that's, that's you know, when we say, when we have pain, I always say we need to connect it to the pain of the Shechina. And so, you know, I've been told in the past through people, you know, through various women, but, but why, how, why do I have to connect it to the Shechina? Like, what's, what's the Indian of connecting it to the Shechina? It's because if the Shechina was not buried in the dust, if the Shechina wasn't separated from its source, from a Kaddish Baruch Hu, which is beyond our realm of intellect of understanding it, but the Shechina is separated from a Kaddish Baruch Hu. If the Shechina would be united and in the place that it belongs, that glorious kingdom, in, that uh, the whole universe would recognize the truth, the emes of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, then there wouldn't be an inyan of any pain anywhere. So by us, whenever we feel any sort of pain, we always have to identify it and identify it with a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Hashem, I'm feeling the pain of lack of parnasa. Hashem, I know your children aren't mefarnas you. They're not giving you sustenance. They're not lifting you up from where, you, from from your place of ashes, right? Mm-hmm. You have children that are chutzpahdik. Oh, yeah. Hashem, I know I'm going through 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 a chutzpah in my house. Oh, the pain of the shechina of her chutzpahdik children. Her chutzpahdik children that don't appreciate the gifts that you give them day in, day out. Always asking for more, give me more, bring me this, do for me that. What we have in our own homes from our children, from our spouses, from our neighbors. Nobody appreciates. We have a lack of appreciation many times. I shouldn't say nobody, but many times there's a lack of appreciation. It all stems from something that's missing with the shechina. It's very important to identify it and lift it up. Isn't that you No, you're not. You're talking about your own private. So you're connected to, I know your children are hooked, but I don't know. Yeah, of course, because every pain that we go through, any experience, personal experience that we have, it's only because there's some sort of lacking in the Shekhinah. If it was Bishlemut, if it was complete and whole, then we wouldn't be experiencing this sorrow. Every lacking. What? He was talking about like jealousy. If you if you feel jealous, you say Hashem, I know you have jealousy. You know that that she was big. Different. That's the name of Hashem. 
Yeah, you can say it that way. It's not, um, so maybe <clears throat> the same would be like Hashem, you know, I'm sure you feel that your kids are equipped with it or something like that, isn't it? Yeah, or, or? It's, uh, we can't deny, and we're not saying here, we're not talking less than how, we're not saying it to somebody else, but what we're saying is that we're identifying the problem, that if I'm experiencing it, it's because on some level or another, HaKadosh, uh, you can't, it's, it's very hard we to, to formulate it. Hashem created the feeling. So if right. Hashem created the feeling, then he must be experiencing it as well. Somehow, somehow it's lacking. It's something that needs to be filled and completed for the Shrina, for us to achieve the Geula, for, for, the, for us to bring and be Makara of the Geula. Okay? Um, okay, now I lost a train of thought, but okay. Can I just ask you, I don't yes. understand how the Shrina is separated from Hashem. I thought it was one and the same. Sorry. There's yeah. a separation. Yeah, it, 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 I, I trust me, Katonti, I am humbled before. I, I, I don't know the exact. I just know that there's definitely a separation between, yeah, there's, there's different manifestations of Hashem. And the feminine aspect of a Kaddish Baruch Hu is the Shechina. And the Shechina, the feminine aspect is not fully united with the m- masculine aspect manifestation of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. It's so, that's why when the Geula comes, Be'ezat Hashem, it'll be, they say it's going to be like literally a chupa, right, where the two will unite again. I'm well, sorry. Yeah. Yes, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's, um, it's the way it was in Chutzlar. We knew Hashem was around, but the Shekhinah wasn't felt there. Mm-hmm. And they said the Shekhinah resides in Israel mostly, in Eretz Yisrael. Right. In Jerusalem in particular. Absolutely. So it's, it's a known fact that it doesn't always go hand in hand. The Shekhinah what? is a higher level of, of Hashem's uh, preference to where to be, right. where to sit. Right. It's the, it's, the ner- it's the feminine as- the feminine aspect of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. It's the nurturing... Um, motherly sort of aspect, like a hug, you know? right? You don't feel Which is that. one of the reasons why we feel alone and, uh, and, and feel so isolated, is because the Shechina is not with us. The Shechina is what? Oh, oh, that's what. Internalization of godliness within each and every one of us, and the Shekhinah is manifest the Fandi in a, in a group of ten, ten Jews. Okay, okay. Baruch Hashem. Hashem. Then the Shekhinah, as you said just now, will be in the Chupa. Be'ezat Hashem. Amen. Be'kov. Okay. Um, so that, that was uh, Benogea to... Would you want to say something? I'm sorry. Oh. That was Benogea to the Etrog. Okay. Um, from Rosh Chodesh Shvat up until the 7th of Adar, which is the year outside of Moshe Rabbeinu, um, the world is filled with Da'at Torah. And every day, a little more Da'at Torah, knowledge of Torah, comes trickling down into this world. The height, the climax of that dot that comes down is on Tu Bishvat. So one of the things that we want to ask for on Tu Bishvat is for Chochmat Torah, for Dat B'Torah. And that's why it's so vital to take upon ourselves something to grow in our Yiddishkeit. Another thing we do on Tu Bishvat that we're able to do is we're able to repair those times that we <coughs> ate throughout the year um, for non-spiritual reasons, okay? We all have at one point or another throughout the year eaten something, guzzled something down, right? Not for a spiritual purpose. That chocolate cake, that chocolate, that ice cream we really wanted to eat. We weren't really thinking of Kaddish Baruch at the time, right? We were just thinking about the yummy taste of the food item. On Tu Bishvat, we get the opportunity to be able to repair um, uh, that mitzvah uh, of eating Be'ezlat Hashem, the Shem Shemayim. In the Sefer Hasidut, it teaches us that we all know this, but just to give it a little bit more, to bring it to life a little bit more, food, when we, di- when we eat food, consume the food, it turns 
into blood and through the consumption of the food the blood then of course goes to our brain and in the brain we produce thoughts through those thoughts they then consequently become our actions so in essence which we all know the food that we eat are actually actually produce actions so that's why it's so important to understand that when we eat not to belittle the brahas not to belittle the whole uh, concept of the, the kavana to have when we're saying the brachas, because in essence we're planting within us a connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Through the food that we eat, when we say a bracha, we connect Hashem, to Hashem, and then our actions that are brought about through that food, that energy that we got through that food item that we consumed, will produce actions that are also connected to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, will lend themselves more to actions of, uh, from a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Um, also, the idea is through the brachas. We recognize also the gracefulness the, 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 the bestowing kindness that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives to us, the endless gifts. We, we, we attain, we're able to absorb positive spiritual energy through the foods that we eat, kosher foods that we eat, and that we say with, with the proper brachas. Because again, we're also tying the whole idea of gratitude and, and, and being thankful to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for all the things that we have. Um, I read somewhere that something very beautiful, when we're hungry, it's actually, imagine, and this is something very interesting because I, I, I find this in my in subconscious in my mind, it's like a Kaddish Baruch Hu ringing a little bell when we're hungry. ding a ling a ling he's actually saying to us, hello, you haven't spoken to me for a while, I need you to speak to me, you're hungry, grab something to eat, say a bracha and remember that I'm here. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a reminder. It's, I, I, want, I want us all to take this and try to apply to our everyday life that when we're, next time we eat, oh, Hashem, you want to hear from me? Like, you know, to, to sort of get excited about it, to understand that it's Hashem sending us a message. I love you. I want to hear from you. Say a bracha. Remember that I'm here. Askula for Shabbos Shira. Very important. This coming Shabbos. It's, uh, like I said, it's a very auspicious time for, for Parnassah. On Erev Shabbos, if we, don't, if we usually don't bake challahs, we should try. If not, we'll buy. Um, we take three rolls, okay? Put them one, two, three on one side of, of, of the person who's breaking the bread, and then three on the other side. I don't know if any, or everyone knows this, but there's an Indian about, in general, having 12, uh, 12 breads, 12, every Shabbos, right? There was 12 lechem panim. No, no, no. On the table, on the table. Sorry, sorry. No, we're not, we're not ultimate consumers here. Yeah. No, each, we should each, uh, there should be on the table, and it's when we, when we, how do you call it? braid the, the challah? We should try to braid each challah from six. So six and six makes 12, because just as in the Besa Migdash, Lechem Panim, there were 12 Lechem Panim. So the same thing is, the Arizal says that that's the way we, we bring down Shefa. But there's an Indian, and particularly during Shep, uh, the, the night of, of uh, Shabbat Shira, that we should have three rolls on one. And it should be set up exactly as I say, three rolls on one side of the one that's saying Hamotzi, right? Three rolls on the other side. And on top of the three on the right, put another three, which makes six on one side. And top of the other three, put another three, that makes six. So six and six will have 12 rolls. And that's how, we, that, that's how the, it should be lifted up to, to Kaddish Baruch Hu on Friday night, on Erev Shabbat of Shabbat Shira. There's a skula, the Rizal says, from there, Shefa Parnasa, Amen to all of Am Yisrael. Okay? Huh? Well, you can also, a la brio, train to me. Huh? That's, no, three and three. No, 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 this is your lech, this is your lechem. This is your lechem. No, no, this is, no, but here you're doing actually three rolls on one, on top of three rolls, three rolls on the other side on top of three rolls, 
I think of it as, as a segel, you know, the vowel, right? The vowel, yeah, the yeah, segel. Yeah. So a segel on top of a segel, and a segel on top of a segel, and that's 12. I mean, this is Kiddush Friday night. Kiddush Friday night. Okay? And you have to eat all of them? No, no. It, just, just, it should be that. You, that's, you, those, that should be what you make that's the bracha on. So what? The Ariza. Like, the Hashem, you bring. The you're the one who brings parnasa to. I, I, you know, when I do potechit, I don't know if you, anybody does this, but when Hash, when my, my husband breaks the bread and he says potechit yadecha, I always lift up my hands. I say thank you, Hashem. It's all from you. I mean, I always have the kavana that it's. Oh. Oh, have, oh have it? Oh, so it shouldn't go through. Oh, I'm catching it. Okay. <laughs> I'll remember that next time. <laughs> Catch it. <laughs> we're all going to No, no, we're all going to do like the end to it. She makes kalas that are, you know, like little rolls, you know. Right. Them yes, them yes. Uh, there's, there's a very big Indian, yes. What I do is I actually make a challah out of, uh, when I do bake challah and I try to, I make a, I, I uh, braid four and then I take two and I twist it and I put it on top so it becomes like this elevated challah. We have to do a fresh challah again yeah. once, yeah. maybe this time we'll do the different shapes, yeah. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> oh wow, we're jumping on the wagon. Okay. I will have to, okay, well let's you know, let's see, maybe. Maybe. Let's see how we'll get it together. Okay, now we're gonna talk about there's a lot more to say. Uh, the Sheva Minim, the seven species. We're gonna go through every single one of them. We're gonna connect every single one of them to the Svirot. The Svira are the Svirot are the manifestations of a Kadashbach, the way that Hashem relates to this world. Okay, don't, don't you want on me, please just stick with me. There's a lot of information here. Okay, wheat. Wheat represents the sphere of kindness, okay? Wheat represents the work, the avodah on the neshama, okay? It's the work of the spirit on our neshama. Wheat is a basic human product, right? The, the basic human need is for bread. So through wheat, we recognize and proclaim, proclaim proclaim before Hashem that He is the ultimate provider of all of our basic needs. We start with the basics, then if we, of course if He provides us with the basics, He provides us with all the rest. So through wheat, we express to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, um, we acknowledge His kindness, and we acknowledge the fact that He is the ultimate provider of all of our, our needs. So in essence, it's actually an emotional avoda that we do through the, uh, having wheat on the table during Tu Bishvat, because we're rec by that, by, by, uh, it's very, again, what we said is that the, the whole idea of teva, of nature, is to drown us and to, to hide Hashem's hand. And so by us working on our emotions and emuna from the word litamen, to train ourselves by constantly training ourselves against the forces of nature, that Hashem is here, Hashem is with us all the time, He cares for us, He's providing for us, He's, um, he's, he's taking care of all of us against all logic, defying all logic and all of that we see. We're, uh, it's an uh, avodah on our emotions, it's, it's an avodah on, our, on our, the, spirit, the emotional realm within ourselves that we're working on our feelings and instilling in ourselves this thankfulness, this gratitude towards the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Barley. Barley uh, represents the sphere of Gevura. Um, it's working on our animalistic soul, on our uh, animalistic side um, within, because barley <coughs> is animal food, right? It's food that, uh, that's grain that's given to the animals. And so it, it reminds us of that animalistic side that we have inside of us. And therefore, when we consume barley, we're meant to think to elevate our animal, the at animalistic side of us and elevate it to be more spiritual. Also, the korban of the se'ora, of the, of the barley, was actually what we were actually offering to Hashem. We were offering to Hashem the humanity, the human side, the spiritual side, the human, the human inside of us, these, the, the, the essence of us, which is our, our, the, human, the human being that we know. Who are we? We're not our body. We're our neshama. So we were actually sacrificing to HaKadosh Baruch Hu by, we were, we were acknowledging, we were recognizing in front of, to bring in front of Hashem that korban. We're giving you that animal side of us because that's not really who we are. We're actually our neshama. 
Okay? Figs. Figs represent netzach, victory, the sphere of victory. It actually, the avoda that's connected to figs is working on our thoughts, our speech, speech and our actions. No, um, I, I didn't miss it. I'm just, this is the order that I put it down. Yeah, sorry. Um, Working on our thoughts. Our thoughts, speech, and actions when we eat figs. Okay, it reminds us to be very quick to perform actions. How do we learn this from the fig? The figs ripen at different stages. And so we have to pick the figs very quickly because if we don't pick them right when they're ripe, ripened, what happens when they're ripe? They go downhill, right? They start to deteriorate. So they, they start to rot. So the idea is the figs with the figs we learn to be quick to perform mitzvot. Um, something I heard recently by Rabbi Wall Wallerstein Schlitter, he said something very beautiful. And he said, if you think that Ornava, which is the yeshiva, the empire that he's created, which is amazing, the amazing tzaddik. If you think that Ornava would not come into fruition if it wasn't for Rabbi Wallerstein, you're wrong, right? He says, ra, ra, I, if it wasn't me who would have taken the idea of Ornava, somebody else would have done it. It's just that I was quick. Quick enough, I, the idea was brought, and I went with it. And I thought about it for myself. I thought to myself, the daily dose of Amuna would have happened. If not by a writer, it would have happened. So somebody else would have had the daily dose of Amuna. And so that's why it's so important when a mitzvah comes your way, when an idea comes our way, it's very important to not procrastinate. Not to hand over, not to, to, to pass on the buck, but to, to jump in it and to do it and to initiate that, that thought. <coughs> also, because of the fact that figs ripen at different stages, we also have to search for them. In between the unripened figs, we have to pick out the, and look for the ripened figs. This is very important. Another lesson that we learn is that we have to search out also the good deeds. So in other words, it's not just to sit there and wait for the opportunity or the thought or the, or the chesed idea to, co to come my way, but it's to initiate, it's to think of, it's to create, it's to be proactive and go after it. Okay? Um, pomegranate, which is hod, splendor. It's working on our mitzvot. Okay, we all know the, the idea behind the pomegranate, 613 seeds approximately in every pomegranate, representing tariag mitzvot. What we have to know about tariag mitzvot is not every one of us can perform all of the 613 mitzvot. So we need to here tie in again the whole idea of of unity and connecting to one another and Klai Yisrael, we have to understand that we have to rely on one another. If one does this mitzvah, does the, excels in this mitzvah and the other one excels in that mitzvah, if we, 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 we stay united, if we, can, if we consider ourselves limbs of the same body, it's as if we're, we are actually um, connecting ourselves to performing all of the mitzvot, how important it is to be united with one another. Um, also, the, the shoresh, the root of the word rimon, which is the Hebrew translation of pomegranate, is romem, to elevate. The pomegranate, through the mitzvot, we actually in, hinted in the word pomegranate, is the idea of us elevating ourselves through the kiyum, through the um, fulfillment of uh, the mitzvot. Grapes. Grapes are tiferet, their beauty. Um, the Midah to work on is the Midah of Simcha. Each Jew um, is able to excel in a specific part of the Torah. How, how do we learn that through grapes? Grapes can be used in a variety of different food items. We, we can make wine, vinegar, juice, raisins, right? It's one of those very diverse fruits. So the same thing is the, us Jews. Every Jew can excel and use their, their ma'alot, use their positive attributes for doing something and excelling in some part of Torah mitzvot. So the, what we learn from the grapes is, is the, 
the most important thing, uh, wine is used in all of our smachot, in our simchas. So the idea is, through grapes, we learn the, uh, the concept of how important it is to be besimcha. And the way we achieve simcha is that we understand that even if I don't excel in one thing, and it's hard for me to do chesed, but I'm very good at, um, I don't know, organizing, and, and that I'm, I excel in that. So I can go into the shul and I can organize the sifrei kodesh, you know, when I come into shul, or find something else that I'm really good at and, and work on that, and that will bring me simcha, that will fill me up. Um, the other thing we, le- we learned through grapes, which is something very beautiful, is that the large clusters hang over the small clusters. So we also learn the meter of humility, how the, the people who are gadol b'torah, how they actually they are, they make themselves lower. Because they're so heavy, they actually hang lower than the, the smaller clusters. So what is that showing? That you could be gadol b'torah, right? But you're going to, as if be lower down, you're going to be lesser than those who are smaller than you. So we learn the, the mida of humility. <coughs> Dates. Dates teach us um, the, uh, the concept of spiritual growth through hard work. They represent kingship, malchut. Um, it takes 70 years for a date tree to grow. And we can use every part of the date tree. It's one of those very rare trees that every part of the date tree is used for the love, for the fruits. Um, they're, they're, I read it somewhere, the, the, the fibers are used for ropes. I mean, every part of the date tree, Bikitsu, is, is used. And the whole idea of the dates is that it grows straight, right? And it doesn't move with the winds, it's very strong, it's very steady. And so even with the strong winds, no matter how tall it is, it still is staying straight. And, and that's the, the, the straightness of the heart of the tzaddik, that the tzaddik goes one path. He sees only HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There are no detours, there's no right, oh, maybe I'll go a little bit right. Now the way of the generation is, uh, they're going a little bit, maybe I'll go right, maybe I'll go, no. He's straight with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Also, the old, in the old age, the date trees still produce fruit. They're still fresh. They're still full of sap. Same thing with us. There is no age limit. Oh, I'm, I'm getting older. I don't, you know, I can't do it. I, I lost my zest. No such thing. The date tree teaches us that even in our old age or our growing age, um, we could still say, uh, be fresh and, and keep Torah and mitzvot. Olives, which is the last but not least, it uh, represents the sphera of foundation of Yesod. Um, the concept of olives is that an olive is a very bitter fruit, and it gets transformed to being edible and not bitter through the process of making olives. The idea be, uh, that we learn from the avoda we learn from the olives is that um, we can take something that's considered as if useless something that's irrelevant, something that's not important, something that we would throw by the wasteland, right? We can, we can take it and we can elevate it and we can make something of good use for it. Also, of course, what we know is that the olives, of course, have to be crushed. We all know this. The first crushing is the most precious and um, excellent oil, same as uh, Am Yisrael. Am Yisrael needs to be unfortunately crushed, crushed and, and go, go through hardships in order to produce light in order to produce that light, not just light, but light that was used to light in the, to ignite the, the flame of the menorah and the Besamikdash, the holy, the holy place of it all. Also, leaves, the leaves of the olive tree don't fall off. They don't wither in the winter and, or, or in the summer. So too, Klal Yisrael, we don't lose um, the leaves. We don't, we don't lose. We're, we, we stay strong. We stay attached to the, that olive tree. We stay attached to that holiness. Okay, now we're going to get... What's this related to in the Sefirot olive? Uh, kingship, to uh, Malchut. Ah, that was the Yisod. Sorry, Yisod, foundation. No. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Okay, um, now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of the seder of Tu Bishvat. Okay. The idea, when you set up the table for Tu Bishvat, is the idea is variety. Variety is very important. It's not the quantity. You don't have to have a kilo of every fruit. Even if you have two pieces, the idea is to have as much variety of fruits. And so we're going to go through 
all, all the different things that belong on the three different plates that you're going to set up. Um, what we need for the Seder is four cups of wine or juice. Okay, the four cups of wine or the juice, this is all pi al pi ha arizal. Uh, the arizal actually went and had an actual tu bishvat Seder, Haggadah. Just like the Pesach Haggadah, there was a Haggadah that the Arizal um, actually um, had made up, and this is what it consists of, um, what we're learning here. The four cups of wine represent the four seasons, that represents the four worlds. Okay, so this is four seasons. The four seasons, the four worlds, okay? Um, the four levels of creation, which are earth, water, air, and fire. And also the four parts of the body. Okay, I'll just pause it then. We're, okay, we're continuing on. Okay, the four, um, so the four cups represent, we spoke about it. The first cup of wine or juice, okay, represents the winter. So it should be all white. Okay, white grape juice. White wine, white grape juice, all white. It represents winter. What we are going to, and this is, it's really important if we can, this is, these are the times where we instill the love of Yiddishkeit into our children. So if you have little kids and you want to, any, any kid, any, any age kid, I mean, you want to give them the love of Yiddishkeit and appreciation of, of this beautiful world that the Kaddish Baruch Hu bestowed upon us, this is the time we can get them involved. They drink the white, you know, the white cup of juice and, and you say to them, okay, you know, let's talk about nature. What happens in the winter? What happens to the trees in the winter? And you talk about the blank, you know, the blank uh, feeling on the trees that everything is empty. And you talk about the changes that happen outside, um, how the animals behave in the winter. Okay, so these are the things that you want to stimulate conversation with. Is this be like we make kiddish first? No, uh, so no, we're no kiddish. We're doing. We've done. We've eaten our Friday night meal. Oh, this is after right. Night. We've oh, eaten our meal. Have wine after the meal. You don't have to have wine again. You could do grape juice. You could do grape juice, you have and you don't have to have a. Be, it could be. A, it should be a schnapps cup. It okay. doesn't matter. Okay. It's for the. It's for the skula. It's for the Indian, right? Of the of the night. Okay. Um, second cup represents spring. So we're going to take that white grape juice or wine, and we're going to put a tad bit of red wine or red grape juice in it just to, like that pinkish tint to have in it okay and we're going to talk about the melting snow and the flowers that are blooming and the colors changing around us and we're going to talk about the trees and the animals and what happens usually during the springtime the third cup is going to represent summer so it's going to be mostly red with just a little bit of white and we're going to again talk about the deepening colors and how nature is in full bloom. And we're going to talk about the fruits and the vegetables, how they're starting to come out in the, in the heat uh, of, of the summer. And the fourth cup, which represents autumn, it's a full cup of red, uh, something red, red grape juice or red wine. And again, talking about all the um, things that happen during the fall. Okay, here's where you're going to need paper and pen. I'll go through it slowly. We're going to set up three plates or platters on the table. The first is going to represent fruits and seeds and nuts that represent olam ha'asiyah, okay, which is our world. They include bananas, coconuts, and it's important to keep these fruits and veg these fruits and, and nuts together so that we understand. Bananas, coconuts, pineapple, melon, and I'm going to soon talk to you why Dafka these, <coughs> kiwi, almonds, walnuts, peanuts, pistachios, pomegranate. That's Olam Asiya. Again, bananas, coconut, pineapple, melon, kiwi, almonds, walnuts, peanuts, pistachios, pomegranate. Second platter. You're saying you should have 
All of these? You can, you, can, you can have two, three platters all in one section of the table. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it. Hold on. First, first write down the information. What? Ideal, all of them. All of them. That's what I said. The, the Arizal says 30, 30 different varieties on the table is really the minimum that he suggests. That's being suggested. Yeah. No, no. Well, I didn't say not. I said 30 varieties. Doesn't mean that's, maybe it wasn't kiwi at the time. But I'll just soon explain to you why Dafka, these type, what, what it constitutes, Olama Asiya. It could be also uh, fresh, fruit. fresh fruit. Absolutely. Okay, Olama Yetzira. Okay? Olama Yetzira. Peaches. <coughs> Peaches. Plums. Apricots, avocado, dates, cherries, I feel like I'm giving a shopping list, <laughs> plums, <laughs> ma sorry, mango, I must like plums, olives with pits. Because each one has a stone. I soon you. Hold on, hold on, hold on, we're getting there, yep. Number three. Olam Habria. Olam Habria. Grapes or raisins. Apples. Kumquats. Sorry. Grapes or raisins. Kumquats is like a Chinese little orange. Those little oranges. Okay. Grapes, raisins, apples, kumquats, oranges. Lemons, figs, pears, and any sort of berry, cranberry berries. Okay, then we need to have on the table beer for barley, mm -hmm. wheat for crackers, crackers for wheat, sorry, um, honey, and fragrant flowers. Plants on the table. Beer for barley, beer for wheat. Um, honey and fragrant flowers or plants on the table. Okay, now we're going to go through what each world represents and why Dafka these fruits and nuts. Atsilut, hold on, I didn't. Atsilut are the fragrant flowers. Right, there are no, and I'm going to talk about that. Okay, so let's let's go through this real quickly. Okay, Olama Asiya. The olama asiya, these are the things you should you take notes because then when we're eating them, we want to discuss why we're having dafka these, okay? And we're going to talk, asiya is action, the world of action, that's our olam. World, the olama asiya is the, the world that's farthest from perfection, it, and it requires the most protection. If you'll notice, on the fruits and the vegetables, they have a hard, inedible, outer, shell okay so they're soft on the inside and they have a protective shell on the outside and what we need to think about when we eat these fruit and fruits and nuts and again these are things that's important to think about this it's it's a very spiritual night listen to this we're rem we thinking about removing those shells that encapsulate us and peel away those layers of materialism and the Yetzahara and those things that stop us from connecting ourselves to Kaddish Baruch Hu, those are the shells, the klipot, the husks, that, that harder, you know, fortress that we spoke about before that, that hides us from feeling, from attaching ourselves to the essence of life. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the, what the Yetzahara has, it's such a grip on us, we're envisioning when we eat these fruits and these nuts, that we're peeling away those layers and, and attaching us to Hashem. So should it be presented on the table with or without the klipa? With, with. We actually want to physically do that, that avoda. And then we want to talk about and bring a subject. We want to make a whole discussion about this. How can it be that there is a person of such, such a person that's hard on the outside, yet soft on the inside? And an example could be a, so, a soldier, a soldier. 
He looks very manly, very hard, very tough on the outside, but he could be a very young, you know, yummy, mushy, you know, soft, sensitive person on the inside, right? Policeman, right? We, so we want to open the, the floor up for a discussion. So it's the world of action. Second, Olama Yitzira is the world of formation. Yeah, sorry, we're giving him more. Yitzira is the world of formation. The world of formation is a less level of, it, it's a less level of purity, okay? It's not quite as far away from perfection, it's sort of in the middle. And the, the fruits that we spoke about, they're soft on the outside, okay? Like the earth and the heart, they're strong. Right? The, there's the, the, the earth and the heart. There's the earth, okay? And the inside is the heart. There, what keeps the vitality going. The idea is to strengthen our hearts. When we eat and participate in these fruits, we're, uh, we're looking at strengthening our hearts. Right? Giving ourselves koach to regrow. Right? Um... Usually the seeds, the pits, are something we throw away and we don't pay attention to. Yet they're, when we, they're, they're the essence of the continuation of that species. So we have to understand that something, again, we spoke about this before, is that something we consider to be irre irrelevant, we should actually be able to take it and see use in it and to, to use it uh, somehow or, or another in the world. And, and through these fruits and vegetables, we, we talk about the continuation of our generation, right? How important it is. And we talk again about how people could be like that, soft on the outside, but hard on the, uh, the inside. And I gave an example of the, uh, the evil queen of Snow White, you know? How, you know, on the outside, she was, right? Very, uh, uh, how, 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 you know, she played um, when she was the old lady and gave the, the, the apple to Snow White. She played that she was very nice and, you know, this old lady and so soft on the outside, but yet inside she was very evil, right? Just dumb an idea. Um, and uh, another thing we we're going to talk about is if in this world, uh, Olama Yetzira is breaking away and releasing that growth pr uh, potential through that pit, through that seed, right? When does it cease to be what it was and it becomes something new? It's when it rots in the ground, right? That's what happens to a seed. So in other words, sometimes, and, and uh, this is my closing, uh, closing uh, point, but I'll... I'll uh, you know, say it now, when is there a room for growth? There's room for growth when we finish to become yesh and we become ayin. In other words, when we break down ourselves, we, we're nothing. We recognize the nothingness of ourselves. We recognize that we're really nothing, that we're, we're, we're solely 100% dependent on HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then we can become yesh. Then we have a place to attach ourselves and become yes to attaching ourselves through the supreme being of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. How important it is. So this is something we could dis discuss about um, when we're eating and participating in the fruits and nuts of uh, Olama Yetzira. Olama Bria, the world of creation, which is the most holy. These fruits represent people who are good through and through. The whole thing is edible the outside and the inside. There's no protective shells, nothing on the outside, no peels, right? Nothing within or without. That's the realm of intellect. And it represents a connection to a Kaddish Baruch Hu with no barriers. It's an elevated state where it's, there's an unbreakable connection to a Kaddish Baruch Hu that's the spark. That's that's the spark of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's there. Then Hashem is their sense of ego. That's their identity. They don't have a personal ego. Their ego is Hashem. Their identification. Right. Hashem. Well, that's the whole. That's the whole Indian of humility. Humility. People miss uh, have a misconception that humility is I'm nothing. I'm worthless. 
It's not. It's um, uh, the whole world was created for me. The whole world was created for me. I'm 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 of supreme value, but I'm only be valuable because I'm connected to that of value, which is a kaddish baruch mm -hmm. So that is, it's seeing the value of me, but I'm valuable because a kaddish baruch I'm a part of a kaddish baruch uh, the supreme value. Baruch Hashem. But they're edible. You pick you 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 you, you can you can um, sugar them. Right? How many? They're, they're, you, you can eat them. Yeah. They're, they're all, they're 100% edible. They're, they're, that fact that we don't want to eat it is we don't want to eat it, but they're 100% edible. Wire lemons, you could eat the skin. Yeah. So good. Right. You, you could sugar the peels. Uh, kiwi was olamasia. I guess it's, it's, it tends to be something you don't necessarily do. Maybe that's why. It's not common. Okay, let me go through this because I know it's getting late and um, Susan wants to wrap up what? Yes. That a lot of the fruits of Olamasia, right, are like allergenic. Oh, yeah? I didn't notice. Like peanuts, almonds, like peanut allergies. Oh, oh interesting. Oh, okay. So, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. It's something that's good. I need to do research on. Interesting point. Okay. Olama Atzilut, world of um, uh, emanation. Okay. So that's there's no that's that's the smell. That's the smell. There's no fruits in this world. It's pure godliness. Olam Atzilut. It's the, it's it's a, a place in time a Tiamat Mashiach. It's a place in time where we're pure spirituality. I mean, the, the the whole idea of smell. Smell is a very highly holy sense, and that's why we want to smell and say the bracha of Bore Mine Besamim, because that's the true godliness. That's the godliness. That's why we smell. Besamim in Havdala is to rejuvenate that that the body of ours when the the neshama yatara yatara you know is is leaving us and we become weakened so we want to revive it through the 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 holy act of smelling <coughs> and that's why we either smelling spices or flowers whatever have things to smell at the table okay all right I'm closing up um, so the idea. Um, which I already spoke about, which of yesh and ayin. So let me just... The what? Barley was for beer. Barley is for beer. Now that's just separate. That's just to have to represent the, the sheva minim, the seven species. Let me just close up and then I'm going to be able to... I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to Okay, so these are the thoughts that we should we should leave off with tonight. That the roots of Klal Yisrael are strong and deep. That our enemies don't see our roots. They're hidden deep in the ground. And just as on Tu Bishvat, in the mists of winter, the trees don't look fruitful or alive, we shouldn't worry, we shouldn't fret, because our vitality is coming forth, but it's just hidden from the human eye. Even though Klal Yisrael appears to have little chance of survival, the lesson on Tu Bishvat is that it's a new year for growth for man towards our ultimate fulfillment collectively and personally as it's written in the Sefer Yeshaya in the days to come Yaakov shall strike root Israel shall sprout and blossom and the face of the world shall be covered with fruit and so my bracha to us all is that Hashem should help us to grow and thrive and bear an abundance of spiritual fruit now and always. Hallelujah. Amen.